We all have our own idea of our dream home. But the reality is many of us have to put up with houses that just don't work. So we have three bedrooms and there are eight of us. The main issue that we've got with the house is space. You do it, eh? Nothing worse when you have a row and you can't go anywhere. <laughs> but it is possible to get more house for less money. Transforming a house into something spectacular might seem unaffordable, but I really believe it is possible to create your dream home for a fraction of the price of going and buying one if you get it right. That is what the class as large and in charge. Last year saw a whopping 164,000 home extensions successfully granted planning permission. But get it wrong and a badly designed extension can knock thousands off the value of a house. Blimey, so you're 50% over already? Yeah. Yes. We're burning about £2,000 a day. It's a scary moment. In this series, I'll be following the fortunes of those attempting to radically overhaul smaller homes for a fraction of the cost of buying a bigger one. You've made £120,000 of equity in the house. Yeah. So yeah. That is really yeah. good. That's a lot of money. It's never a simple undertaking. More of Stay calm. The more months this goes on, the worse it's going to get financially. I'm fucking going to cry. <laughs> but the rewards can be immense. And it is huge, mm -hmm. but it is fantastic. What more would you wish for? I don't think I could ask for anything more. It's beautiful. afford to buy it, you don't necessarily have to give up on getting your dream home. You may find that you can transform a much lesser home into something spectacular. This week I'm with two homeowners who want to create truly magnificent homes for a whole load less than it would cost them to buy one. On the south coast near Portsmouth, free spirits Ben and Catherine want to create a colossal floating home at sea. He came to me and said, there's this barge for sale, how about turn it into a home? But first, I'm off to Horndean in Hampshire, where Pete, Teresa, their two kids and boisterous dog are bursting at the seams of their tiny 1950s bungalow. Poor Pete comes home from work some nights and I'm just saying, just can't deal with it anymore. Pete and Dress run a family tyre business locally. Four years ago, they spotted the bungalow and realised the potential of its large plot. Everything further up the road has already been either developed or sold. It's the only house sort of bringing the area down. It's like the tatty house in the street. Since buying it for £265,000, the family of four have squeezed into it whilst they saved up for an extension. The lounge is the everything room, dinner, TV. We knew it wasn't going to be easy to live in. We just either spend a lot of money on putting it right or put the money towards the build, so the money was all gone towards the build. Two growing kids and a large dog is a demanding combination for any household. But the Mitchies are squashed into a single-storey house and are now desperate for more space. Being within easy reach of both the coast and the capital means Hampshire house prices command a premium. Tress and Pete have brought me to their dream home in the area, but at £700,000, they just can't afford it. I always drive past houses like this and just think, oh, yes, please, one day. What is it that you like about this house? It's got five bedrooms, it's got the big kitchen diner. You can cook your dinner and still talk to people. That's what I would really, really like. To buy their dream home would cost around £700,000. Their place is worth 300000 so there's a hearty shortfall of £400,000. And they only have a budget of 110000 The Mitchies want to nearly triple the size of their house, but does their bungalow have enough potential to realise their ambitious plans? This is such a big piece of land and such a little bungalow. It could be such a wonderful home. The current design of their cramped 1950s bungalow makes it a tough squeeze. It has three bedrooms, a family bathroom, lounge and kitchen. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, hello, 
<laughs> Hello. Hi. Rudy's quite a big dog. I'm constantly following him around the house with a mop because of muddy footprints, and you can't shut him off anywhere because he just lets himself in. Quite a lot of dog and not a lot of house. How does this kitchen not work for you at the moment? It doesn't work when you've got a big family. We have a fold-away dining room table that we have to get out every night, eat our dinner and then fold it away when we're done. And Tress has got a special hobby which also takes up space in the living room. Blimey, what's this? <laughs> this is my pole. <laughs> This is your pole? Yes. Obviously. Obviously, Absolutely. of course. Well, Why? most sitting rooms do have a pole in the middle. Yes. Um, so I guess as it's, as it's not a fire station, it's for dancing, is it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fitness and exercise. Show me a bit. Go on, one thing. Go on, one okay. thing. OK. Um, OK. <laughs> you, you never know when you might need a quick pole dancing oh, session. Absolutely. Though. I'm not going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do? You just lift just yourself lift up? Lift yourself up, yeah. It's quite hard work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Blimey. It's very hard. Between the pole dancing and the dog, this is a mad household. <laughs> Over the next six months, the family want to make their bungalow three times the size with an extension and loft conversion. Downstairs, they want a kitchen diner, large lounge, two bedrooms, utility, guest bathroom and playroom with space for the dog. In their new upstairs, they'd like three further bedrooms, an ensuite, a walk-in wardrobe, a family bathroom, a children's study and even a storeroom. There are a couple of things I was going to ask you about which I kind of thought was really interesting. One of them is upstairs. What's the store for? Everywhere we've had is always had a loft to, to hide all your junk in. Well, I've got to be honest, I think you would be better off making this bedroom bigger. And then you could have a utility room up there where you have the washing machine and the tunnel dryer and the drying rack. And... <laughs> <laughs> you, you so want that. I love that idea. If they lose the storeroom, they can use half the room to create a bigger bedroom and use the other half as an upstairs utility room, which frees up space downstairs for Rudy the dog. I like the idea of him having his own space so that when I go to work, I'm not giving him free run of the house. Pete and Tress have, have got an amazing plot of land with just this little bungalow on it, but I do think they've overloaded their plans, and with the complications of all of their needs, this is going to be an interesting journey. Near Portsmouth on the south coast, professional boat builder Ben and his administrator wife Catherine also live in very close quarters. We've lived in this caravan for seven years. Um, ben moved down here with his business, and this was only supposed to be a temporary measure, initially for two-year period. <laughs> it has been tough at times. In the winter, you're trying to keep the heat in, and then in the summer, you just want to get it out of the caravan. Yeah. <laughs> There's not enough room for ever, anything, you know. You have to store tinned food in the cupboards in the front room because there's not enough room in the kitchen. And... When it comes to moving, we'll probably find stuff that we thought we'd lost. <laughs> the adventurous couple have fallen out of love with their old caravan, but they're still in love with the location. Where we live is a pretty special place in my mm. mind. It's quite nice this morning, isn't it? Now they're embarking on their biggest adventure yet, gambling £35,000 to buy a vast, rusty ex-military barge they want to transform into their dream home. For me, there's a, an aversion to following the norm. You yeah. could probably fit five double ensuite bedrooms in there. Well, we'll spend on this. You would not even be able to buy a one-bedroom flat. Ben's planning on literally doing all the work himself, using reclaimed materials wherever he can. A lot of it is going to be manual labour at the start, and I'm not built for manual labour, I'm afraid. <laughs> ben and Catherine have spent seven years living in a caravan, and now they're hoping to swap that lifestyle for living on a massive military boat. But they're planning on doing most of the work themselves, and it's a huge undertaking. I'm meeting them at the boatyard where they currently live and where their barge will be permanently moored. So if I'd said to you ten years ago you're going to end up living on a boat, would you have said, yeah, no, I see that? We were planning to build our own house and ever since we've moved here it seems to have become more of a natural thing to, 
We thought to land's build. too easy, we'll build it on water. <laughs> it is a way of life, isn't it? it? Is. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not. not purely a financial decision. The sums certainly add up. To buy a 279 square metre home by the water in this area would cost over a million pounds. They snapped up the barge for a mere £35,000 and for only a further £80,000 they plan to build their dream home. The barge is having its rust dealt with at a dry dock and I can't wait to see her for myself. There she is. Yep, there she is. Amazing. The enormous rusty hull weighs around 200 tonnes and is nearly 30 metres long. The plumbers may seem crazily ambitious, but with a little inspiration, you can create amazing homes out of barge conversions. But they can be challenging builds. Because it's vast, isn't it? It's really, really, really long. Yeah. Did you ever think when you first saw her that this might be a bit too far? Oh, no, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I'm going to be honest, I look at it from here and think, yeah, I see the dream. I take my hat off to Ben's gung-ho attitude. They're certainly thinking big. Ben and Catherine want to maximise natural light by having an upside-down home. Upstairs, they want a massive open-plan kitchen and living space with a separate pantry and laundry room. Outside, a decked area to enjoy the sea views. Downstairs, they hope to create a huge master bedroom with ensuite and walk-in wardrobe. Two guest bedrooms, a guest bathroom and an enormous cinema room. So down here, this is the cinema room, is it? Uh, yep. Yep. That's the last job. This is used as the workshop for the build. So this is what you're reckoning will drive him forward? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. And so where are the bedrooms going to be? Well, our bedroom starts here. Here. <laughs> um, our bedroom starts here. It's vast. Enormous. Yes. It's a huge barge, and it won't be easy making it feel homely. Whilst obviously having too much space is a nice problem to have, um, getting that layout wrong is going to be quite easy. Obviously, we're not going to know that we've got it right, but, but we, can change our mind we as think we go along. that we have. They only have an £80,000 budget. Putting off making decisions about layout could be costly, and there's also the practical issues of a home made only from steel. It's going to be cold. Most important thing is you somehow create a living pod within the steel mm. hull and keep the pod warm yeah. rather than try and keep... You couldn't possibly no. keep the whole no. boat warm. No. If Ben and Catherine do manage to pull this off, they could end up with their dream home, but if they get it wrong, they could end up with a massive cavernous space it doesn't really feel like home at all. I'm with two families who are poles apart, but both want to create dramatically different homes without getting in the red. In Hampshire, Pete and Tress's build is supposed to be underway, but they've received some very bad news. Hello? Hi, Sarah, it's Tressa. Oh, hi, hello, how are you? Not great, actually. My builder was due to start this week and he's had a, he's had a bereavement in the family. Oh, how awful. Yeah. So I said, well, OK, I'll give you a bit of time. Yeah. Um, it's been a week now and I, I just don't know what, what to do, where to go from here. My gut feeling is that you trusted him. He's come highly recommended, you've seen his work. I feel you should just wait. Mm. So the other option would be whether I sort of project managed it until he was ready to come back on board. I think you might be getting yourself in very, very deep water that way. Yeah. Just a few more weeks waiting. With the build on hold, Tress is determined to use her time wisely and is planning the interior design. Because the kitchen colours are black, white and purple, I want to carry that on into the living room. So basically my media wall, my TV wall, I want something really dramatic. I was originally thinking skulls, but there's a problem. It's going to clash with my pole. Silver and gold don't go together. My friend will have to bring her silver pole round to go with the living room and I'll have my pole in my bedroom. <laughs> That's so funky. Tress has got some wild ideas for her walls and she wants funky flooring too. So I'm going to show her this designer showroom in West London. 
Have you decided what sort of flooring you're going to have yet? At the moment, for the main sort of walkway areas, probably thinking stone. The advantage with this floor is it's a poured resin. I think it's fantastic because you can have any pattern you want to on it. So you could have a picture of your kids. You could have a pattern that you could design yourself. You could have spots. You could have spots. <laughs> you could have anything in your dreams. Most importantly, it's hard wearing. And I've brought along her not so little friend to prove it. <laughs> I think to, to show that this is a super practical floor. Look, weeds. Oh, yes. And this flooring is really ideal for people who do have dogs. So if I get a towel, this is so easy to clean, which means that on the muddiest walk, it's going to be impossible to know whether Rudy's been here or not. That's just come right off. It's amazing. In terms of durability, having to share the house with Rudy, this is going to make it a lot easier. Yeah, that's brilliant. Over on the south coast, it's a momentous day. Ben and Catherine's enormous barge is leaving dry land to be towed to their dockyard where it will be permanently moored. I'm very excited. I think it's probably going to be the biggest thing that I've ever done in my life, really. Part of me is eager, part of me is like, oh, my God, what a huge amount of work I've got to do. Upstairs, they want a massive open-plan kitchen and living space with a separate pantry and laundry room. Outside, a decked area to enjoy the sea views. Downstairs, they hope to create a huge master bedroom with ensuite and walk-in wardrobe. Two guest bedrooms, a guest bathroom and an enormous cinema room. They're doing their mammoth build on a budget of just £80,000, but Ben gets off to an impressive running start. By selling the unwanted metal, he strips out from the old hull. We had to pull a lot of scrap metal out of it. Uh, we got 19000 back. That's a big chunk of cash. But one thing self-builder Ben can't control is the weather. And apart from a tarpaulin, the barge is completely exposed to the elements. I suppose the only way you could compare what we have to deal with with the weather and getting stuff to it is if you're trying to build a house on the side of a mountain or something. After years in a drafty caravan, Ben's determined to get the barge's insulation right. And by buying up building site leftovers, he snapped it up for £4,000, less than a fifth of its retail price. But six weeks into the build, this one-man workforce has had a major setback. Had a bit of a stumble and broke my... Hand, one of those moments where you're sort of lying there and it hurts and it's like, oh. <laughs> it still hurts a bit, but you know, it's getting better. Got to get on with the stuff. Ben's putting a very brave face on it, but with so much heavy lifting, a fractured wrist is going to seriously slow him down. Back in Hampshire, the Mitchies should be six weeks into their build, but they've also suffered a serious setback. Their builder has had to pull out completely. Oh, it's, it's been stressful, to say the least. But I have got a very bold idea, which may take away their stress and help to make up lost time. There are companies who will build the loft off-site and then bring it once it's built. And I think in your situation, it might be worth thinking about. Definitely, definitely, definitely look think at it, yeah. that if it helps us at the moment, because we are stuck. Prefabricated lofts can be built fully insulated to your exact specifications. They're delivered with windows, gutters and roof tiles already fitted. Even a loft as massive as theirs can be installed in as little as two days at a total cost of around £100,000. If you'd like to know more about the projects in this week's show, check out my website at channel4.com forward slash beanie. Two months behind schedule, the Mitchy family's build finally gets underway. And although Tress has found a builder, she's had no option but to take on the role of project manager herself. All the trades that we get in, they'll all know their jobs. It's me that doesn't know my job. But the family have opted to have the timber loft built off-site, which will halve Tress's workload. The timber frame has been a dream come true for me. I just honestly do not think I would have coped doing it myself. Their huge new loft will be bigger than their existing home and will weigh a staggering 24 tonnes. The steel RSJ is fitted in preparation for when it's craned on. 
There you go. That's going to hold my house up. Right. <laughs> yes, it is going to. Back on the south coast, the build's about six weeks behind schedule. As well as a fractured wrist, Ben's been battling the worst spring in 50 years. The weather's been a bit of a, a bit of a problem, hence the winter coat. And on the occasional day when it's uh, when it's nice and not raining, we can go outside and uh, get on with some of the welding jobs outside. He's determined to push on, and he's using reclaim materials wherever possible. There was a local hospital that got um, taken down. It's a Victorian building. They used very good quality timbers, and we sourced them all from the demolition company. I think using timber like this saves it from being just burnt. With all their focus on the build, the worry is that Ben and Catherine don't have clear designs for their interior in mind. So I brought them to see a finished barge conversion at St Catherine's Docks in London. I know you've got strong ideas as to how to build it structurally, but in terms of the finish and the design, hopefully this might give you a few pointers. This barge has a sleek, modern interior, but it differs from theirs in one key aspect. It's not going to be a boat that you can sail off away into the sunset and we want it to look like a home inside. Flatty, tight warehouse conversion. And not so much of a boat. When you look at this kitchen, how do you feel about it? Sort of semi-industrial look. I like it. We had this discussion some time ago and uh, I was overruled. You but, were talking uh... about making a kitchen. That's a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> I had an idea of using aircraft trolleys, you know, the ones where they they load up the aircraft with them all on wheels and aluminium <laughs> frames and stuff. <laughs> it was another excuse for him to go to some salvage site and spend the day in his kind of wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just the kitchen they still need to think through. Their barge is almost twice this size, which means they have an awful lot of space to plan. There's a little bit of me that thinks, you've just got so much space you almost don't know what to do with it. And you're thinking, well, we need a bedroom. Uh, what else do we need? Well, yeah, it's, it's a case but... of it's a bedroom and someone might come and stay, so there's another bedroom. And, and what if two people come and stay? So we might as well make our bedroom massive. <laughs> I had to Google what was bigger than a super king bed, and we ended up at Caesar sized. That is supporting my argument that oh, actually it is. I, yeah, I you don't know a... what to do with it. No. Really. I just wonder if it wouldn't be better to, to make those bedrooms slightly smaller and to have another separate living space other than this all in one living space or the bedroom. While Ben and Catherine mull over the best use of their vast space, in Hampshire, the Mitchies are now seven weeks away from their loft arriving. Gosh, look at this. He smashed Hello. it all apart. Yes. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it's really opened it up, hasn't it? Yeah. We feel we've got quite a long way now. I do notice there's a, a massive beam protruding down from the ceiling. I was intending for the steel to be flush to the ceiling so that you couldn't see it. And then I spoke to the loft guy and he said, no, I've got, I've got the steels as below the ceiling. See, I lost a day there on that one because I told the builders to do it the way I wanted and we had to adjust that, so... Do you find it quite overwhelming? The builders are checking what they're doing with me. They're saying, is this right? And my opinion is, well, you're the builder, you know what you're doing. You, you tell me if it's right. <laughs> Very much of the project managing style called Wing It, where we tend to try and make it up as we go along. <laughs> okay, which is always pretty dangerous. <laughs> yes, isn't it, it is quite risky. Something else which can be dangerous is impulse buying. So, this is the flooring you're thinking of having in the kitchen? Yes. So, perhaps not that practical, considering no. your family. I just saw it in the shop and it was a bargain. Absolute bargain. <laughs> well, unless they're paying you to take it away, it's not a bargain. Then you're going to spend 24 hours a day cleaning it yes. or have to get rid of your dog or the children or both. Have you actually bought it already? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but their biggest challenge is yet to come, fitting a whole new fabricated first floor that's bigger than their existing house. I've got the crane arranged locally, so when it all goes wrong on a day, it would be my fault. So your loft will be craned on in sections and they just join it together and hopefully it all fits. Hopefully. Big hopefully. <laughs> in Hampshire, Tress and Pete's first half of the build is well underway. 
at 300 miles north, the top floor of their house is being constructed in a warehouse. Tress and Peter having their timber-framed loft constructed off-site here and then craned into place. I'm really worried that some of the layout that they've got planned at the moment is simply not going to work, and now is the time they're going to have to change it. Today, they'll be seeing it for the first time. Don't want to keep me in suspense any longer. <laughs> <gasps> My God! This is bigger than our house at the moment. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It's... Wow. Seeing it all in one hit is like... Seeing a whole new house. Do you want to see inside? Yes. Come on. <laughs> this is this it. Is it. At the moment, the roof's on and finished, but the layout inside is up for grabs. Wow. It's this area that I think it might be worth making a few changes. All right. I'd like to help them visualise how this space could work better. At the moment, your plans for this space here are like this. So you've got these two rooms on the left, a walk-in wardrobe and an ensuite. And it makes a lovely big open space. Actually quite a small, not very, very small, nice yeah. space. Doesn't look right there. What I think you should be doing is moving this bathroom and the walk-in wardrobe so that you've got windows on both the right-hand side and the left-hand side. You could have the wardrobe behind the bed here, so you walk in from either side. Or you could have the bathroom and wardrobe over in this area. You have wardrobes down there, and then you'd enter the bathroom here. You could have a loo here and a shower here. I'd lose the Juliet balcony and the window and probably put a roof light in so that you can get light that way, but then use all the walls. In terms of layout, though, this is better, yeah. Yeah, your layout is much, much better idea. I'm going to screw this in place. <laughs> yeah, you screw That's it in it. place, yeah. I'm committing you to it. I figure if I do this, you can't change your mind. <laughs> We've saved ourselves a costly mistake, haven't we? Yeah, I think because so, Because yeah. if we'd had everything finished and we didn't like it, then it would, put, it would take a lot to put it right, whereas now we can do it before we go too far. Near Portsmouth on the south coast, Ben and Catherine are halfway through their unique six-month project, building a home in a barge for a modest £80,000. So it's coming on. Noticeable that the cinema is the only bit that's watertight so far. Yes. <laughs> it, it made the most sense to do. Because of the damage to my hand, I couldn't really carry on with the, with the main section. Each of these plates and the beams, everything's sort of 100 kilos plus, so you're still manhandling. So I've sort of been tying bits of rope around my arm above my wrist and pulling on that instead of using my wrist. So when you broke your wrist, you thought, stuff it, I'll tie a piece of rope to my so arm I... and pull it with my arm instead. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a very quick process, it would turn out. Many would say a little foolhardy, but I'm thinking just brave and manly. Professional boat builder Ben is clearly a man on a mission, but there are only so many hours in the day. I mean, it's, it's difficult fitting it all in. It's the busiest time of the year, really, for us as a company. You have to go with what pays the bills, so I have to work on this in between bits and pieces and evenings and weekends, and as long as there's a little bit done each day, I'm happy with that. Ben has poured blood, sweat and tears into this build and, admirably, he's continued using reclaimed materials, sourcing them from wherever he can. The roof frame for the upper floor was once the local ferry terminal. That looks great. Yeah, it's, it's good to see it finally going up and what we made when it was really raining and snowing and everything, Dad and I down inside there, actually sort of fitted together and worked but it's still a long way off completion. God, it's very high, the ceiling, isn't it? Mm. This is not going to feel like a boat no. in any way. And down here is your more finished cinema room. Gosh, it's so pokey. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I took on board what you're saying about the rooms being too big, so we, I bought this wall this way a little bit, put more, more insulation in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll make all the difference. Does it feel all a bit more real to you? Oh, yeah, this is. This is going to be, be a big space quite an achievement. 
Ben and Catherine are passionately championing reusing raw materials. So we're visiting a factory which makes kitchen worktops from broken glass, hoping it'll give them pointers on their kitchen style. What's really amazing about this is that you could use almost anything you want. So you could use the bottles from a party or bits and pieces that you found from the boat. Do you think you could master enough bottles? Cider and Zambuca. Yeah, it's probably for me, Captain Morgan's one. Captain Morgan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so should we crush some glass and yeah. make yep. the work top? Yep. And so here is where <coughs> we pour it into the resin. the ultimately reclaimed boat. And your worktops are going to come from all your old cider bottles. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Once the glass or any personal keepsakes are in the resin, it's polished smooth to create a worktop. So this resin's been coloured pink, and these resins here have had shapes put into them. Yeah, the possibilities for us to uh, put our own bits and pieces in is, is good, isn't it? A little uh, make it personal. Really, the sky's the limit. You can kind of go anywhere you want. If you're keen to be green, here are some clever eco-friendly tips. Tires painted in bright colours make fun and durable children's swings. Old suitcases can be upcycled to make comfy beds for your pets. And there's no end to cool lights you can create from objects found around your home. For more information on projects in this week's episode, check out my scrapbook at channel4.com forward slash beanie. In Hampshire, it's a critical day. In the next 48 hours, Pete and Tress are going to nearly triple the size of their house. Piece by piece, their loft is on its way. Once it's craned on, it needs to fit together perfectly like a jigsaw. We've been waiting and building up to this, and, and I feel like I'm bouncing off the walls at the moment. I think the first one's arrived! <laughs> The £100,000 loft conversion is a walloping 90% of their overall budget, but it's saved them about three months' build time. The success of their whole project is riding on this moment. The first piece weighs nearly six tonnes. They've got it up, but there's a big problem. If you go any further, you're going past the point of no return, isn't it? The crane Pete booked isn't strong enough to swing it into place. We are about six foot out. So the idea is now, if we move the scaffolding, move the crane, that will be enough to get it to where we need it to go. This is the most tricky part because it's the furthest away. The only way it will work is to inch it dangerously close to the house to give it extra reach. Stop. Success. Pete is off the hook. It worked. And more importantly, the jigsaw is fitting together. Tress project managed this build, and finally her dream two-storey home is taking shape. This whole process has made life so much easier. I think I probably would have had a heart attack by now if I was doing it myself. It's going to go mad from now. Once this roof is on, it will be all hands on deck everyone in and just get it finished as quickly as possible. Six months ago, the plumbers courageously set out to transform a 30-metre-long old rusty barge into their dream home. In a feat of engineering, boat builder Ben did most of the work single-handedly, and almost every material he used was reclaimed. This is the ultimately reclaimed boat. It's been a mammoth project on a tiny budget with an ambitious timescale of just six months. Ben and Catherine gambled £35,000 on the hull of a huge, rusty barge. Ben was planning on doing pretty much all the work himself. But it hasn't been easy. He struggled through a bitterly cold winter with a broken wrist. I'm just really fascinated to see how far he actually got. 
At the start of the build, the single-storey hull was rusty and neglected. Now, it's a striking two-storey floating palace. Hi, hello, hello, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi. Hello. Mikey, me, this is the difference. The vast hull was a cold and empty rust bucket. Now it's become a stunning, cleverly zoned, open plan living area. The design really works well because having the utility room and the pantry breaks the space up so you, you come in the door on this side and then having the, the peninsula unit pushes you to move around the space. It, it's not just one great big square space. We did that on a piece of cardboard. Did, yeah. it, like, when we first got it, it was just like a little sketch. This is what I want. <laughs> And they've done all they can for the environment, which has also proved brilliantly cost-effective. When I look around, so much of it has been reclaimed and reused. Just old building site stuff that's, that's new, but it, you know, big building sites just get chucked away. A little bit of time, a few hours every evening, can save you many, many tens of thousands of pounds. This worktop, we went to the factory and, yeah. and this is... Recycled television screens. It's got television screens and bottles, bottles and, and all sorts of stuff in yeah. there. I think what's most remarkable is the fact that you did all of this. I'm, I think in terms of engineering, this is a real feat of it. I just, I mean, I, I'm sort of slightly speechless as to how spectacular it is. Most mm. people thought I was a bit mad, I think. Fairness, you are. So <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, with a boat, it's even more important that you insulate it than a house, really. But how are you heating it? Uh, we've got the, the wood burner. So this one small wood burner is yep. the heating for the whole of upstairs and the whole of downstairs. Yes. Amazing. But I do notice there is a large cavernous hole down yes, here. Yes, there is indeed. And, and below... Is, it's not is. quite as finished, mm, isn't it? Is. <laughs> Downstairs still needs a lot of work, despite Ben's best efforts. It is watertight. All the windows are in. It's ready for us to start working in. You can move in upstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this can be the work in progress. When their huge master bedroom is finished, it will house a colossal 2.4 by 2.7 metre Caesar bed and wooden floorboards throughout will add warmth. Down the corridor, you'll pass the ensuite, two further guest bedrooms and a guest bathroom. At the end, beyond a floating wooden staircase, will be their gigantic cinema room with 4.8 metre screen and luxurious eight-seater sofa. This has been the most amazing journey, mission that you've been on. You bought the initial hull for only £35,000, didn't you? Yep. And then immediately sold a whole load of the inside of it for scrap and got nearly £20,000 back again. Yep. So actually, it really effectively cost you £15,000, really. Yes. So then what did you end up spending fitting it out and making it like this? About twenty-five. And that is really quite remarkable. To buy a waterside house of the same size in this area would cost over a million pounds. So to trade up from their barge would have cost them 985,000 pounds. So far, they've spent just 25,000 pounds. It's an extraordinary saving. But how much more will it take to finish it? Fully finished, 20,000. I you think, think another well, 20 yes. There's no denying it's absolutely staggering what Ben has accomplished for so little. So after seven years of living in a tiny caravan, does it feel worth it? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. 100%. It's a small sacrifice, really, when you look at what we've got. I really admire Ben and Catherine's tenacity in, in seeing through what was seemingly a, an impossible task. What they've managed to achieve is quite remarkable. Coming up, Pete and Tress unveil their made-to-measure masterpiece. This is really luxurious, isn't it? This is like a boutique hotel. 
Seven months ago, Pete and Tress set out on an ambitious project to create a home big enough for their family, nearly tripling the size of their bungalow on a budget of £110,000. But there were problems from the start, forcing Tress to become the reluctant project manager. Ready? The builders are checking what they're doing with me. My opinion is, well, you're the builder. You tell me if it's right. She very wisely opted to get their loft built off-site. Ah! <laughs> oh, my God! This is bigger than our house at the moment. They're now four weeks behind schedule, and there's still a lot to do. Chesley Peak's 1950s bungalow was crying out to be extended, but turning their bungalow into a house didn't come without its problems. I'm hoping they've got over the finishing line. For four years, the family of four, plus Rudy the dog, had been squished together in their tiny bungalow. What a transformation. This home used to stand out in the street for all the wrong reasons, and now it stands out for all the right ones. By extending the ground floor and having a whole first floor dropped on top, their tiny bungalow has become a large family home. Hi, Hi hello, how are hello. you? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Hello. hello. Oh. Hi, Rudy. You were hoping to have a designated area just for Rudy, and you now have the door that keeps, yes. him, keeps him in. He's still getting used to it. Yeah, yeah, it might take a while. Yeah. <laughs> Before, their kitchen was dated and run down, separate from their living and dining room. Great big room, isn't it? Lovely. Now, by knocking through, they've transformed this space, creating a large, deluxe kitchen diner. It is gorgeous. I can't get over it. I cannot get over just how much room we have. It may look stunning, but there's one thing I can't help but mention. When we talked about practical floors, I don't think that this falls in that camp, does it? Let's be honest. No. I'm a sucker for a sale. <laughs> Do you think this is going to be cleaned on quite a regular basis, or are you just not going to let the dog in here ever? I'd go with not letting the dog in. <laughs> <laughs> Their old living room doubled up as a dining room and pole dancing space. By adding an extension, they've gained a large, bright, grown-up room, complete with Tress's quirky wallpaper. It is such a big room, isn't it? It's great. Yeah. I'm liking the um, the skulls. Talk me through. <laughs> talk me through that one. Mm, we're torn on the wallpaper. <laughs> As in, not torn it, it out. It might be in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> There's a marked absence of your pole pole dancing in here. My pole is gold, and my lounge has silver, so it clashes. So I, I I'm going to need to buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> Before they had three small ground floor bedrooms. By craning in a prefabricated loft, they've gained a whole new floor with two rooms for the girls and a huge master bedroom with ensuite. Oh, she's got a brilliant big room. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. One of the really spectacular things about your build is the fact that it actually wasn't built here. It was built somewhere else yeah. and then dropped on top. This is probably as big as half of the house was. Your suggestion of not having the ensuite where we were originally going to have it has just made it a massive, massive room. This is really luxurious, isn't it? And this is like a boutique hotel. It is. It's brilliant. I absolutely adore it. And they've now got a super practical upstairs utility where they had intended to just store Christmas decorations. First-time project manager Tress has done an amazing job. I just wonder if she managed to do it all for their £110,000 budget. It's been quite a tough roller coaster ride, hasn't it, for you? Yeah, there were moments where we didn't even think we'd get started. When you started out, your house was worth about £300,000, was not it? And you had £110,000 to do the work. How much did you end up spending? Um, we think it's a tell up to about 130 in total. Okay. And so how did you spend the extra 20,000? Do you know where that went? 
Not really. Um... <laughs> the sofa, the TV, all the new things that you need in a house. We just focused on bricks and mortar and we forgot about actually making it look pretty at the end. Their dream house was worth £700,000 and they'd have needed an extra £400,000 to buy it. Tress has successfully created their own dream home for £130,000. They may have gone £20,000 over budget, but it's still considerably less than moving, and that's not all. Well, I mean, the good news is, in terms of equity that you've created in your home, I reckon this house would now easily be worth £550,000. So you have created £120,000 of equity in the house. Oh, we're moving then. No, I'm not. Yeah. I've got my dream house. I don't have any reason to leave or do it again, so I'm here for good. But before I go, I've got a surprise for Tress to celebrate her amazing achievement. So I've got a little treat for you. <laughs> wow! <laughs> the silver pole! I figured yeah. after all your hard work, you needed a colour coordinated. Oh. Oh. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a pleasure. <laughs> Let's see your stuff. Jess and Pete are testament to the fact that perseverance does pay off. If at first you don't succeed, change tack. They were open to the idea of a different method of building and they've ended up with a home that may not perfectly suit Rudy, but I think they'll all be able to enjoy into the future.